start off by saying, you know, this is a, a huge humanitarian struggle that we've been facing uh, for several decades. And it's something that as a country, as a city, as a state, we really created. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Forum at UUSF. I'm Jeff Peckerel, the leader of the forum and a chairperson of the Human Rights Working Group, which sponsors the forum. Melvin Starks and Dolores Perez Helbron are also co-chairs of the Human Rights Working Group. Today we have Bar uh, Jennifer Friedenbach speaking from the Homeless Coalition. Uh, Dolores will come up her and give her a proper rec uh, introduction in a few minutes. Before we do that, I just want to do a couple of housekeeping and, and logistics kinds of things. We have a beautiful breakfast for you over here. So if you're on Zoom and you haven't considered attending in person, please think of doing that in the future. We will have our presentation till approximately 10.15, when, at which time we'll begin Q&A. And if you have questions, please try to write them on the cards that we have on the tables and some of the seats. We'll be distributing more of those during the talk. So just put your questions there and we'll do all the Q&A mostly at the end of the meeting. Okay, uh, I hope you'll come back next Sunday when we will be having a topic related to African American History Month, Black History Month. Uh, Melvin has arranged for a professor from uh, USF, I believe it is, named James Taylor, and he's gonna be speaking about the 13th Amendment. All right, so that should be a good talk. And then the week after that, we have uh, some people from the American Friends Service Committee will be talking to us about police militarization. And then the first week of March, we have Fred Glass giving a talk on the history of labor organizing in California, which I think will be a very interesting talk. So please come back for all those upcoming sessions. And at this time, I'd now like to welcome Willard, who's going to give our Ohlone land recognition. Good morning. We, members of the First Unitarian Universalist Society of San Francisco, acknowledge that our community is located in the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramatush Ohlone tribes, the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. <clears throat> we recognize that we benefit from living and working here, <clears throat> and we affirm that their sovereign rights as first people. The Greater Bay Area is also the ancestral territory of the Miwok, Yokuz, Patwin, and other tribes as the original stewards of this land. The indigenous people understood their interconnectedness of all things and maintain harmony and nature for a millennia. We honor them now for their enduring commitment to our mother earth. That's a very strong, you know, affirmative statement. I just want to acknowledge that the tribal people are still here with us. And of course, you may have heard of the uh, Grayton Rancheria, you know, in, you know, Northern California. So there are federally recognized tribal governments that are still thriving. So please enjoy the program today. Thank you, Willard. Um, now I'm going to introduce Jennifer Friedenbach, a speaker for today. Jennifer is currently the executive Director of the Coalition on Homelessness in San Francisco. She has worked on the coalition for the coalition for 25 years as executive director, an organizing director, substance abuse and mental health work group coordinator, and fundraiser. Previous to coming to San Francisco, Jennifer was director of the Hunger and Homeless Action Coalition in San Mateo County. Mrs. Friedenbach has a long history of community organizing and has worked on a range of poverty-related issues pertaining to homelessness, welfare rights, housing, health care, disability, and human and civil rights. She will bring us up to date on the latest news and efforts here in San Francisco on legislation pertaining to housing and the homeless crisis. Welcome, Jennifer. Thank you so much for having me and i um, really happy to be here this morning. Um, wanna just uh, start off by saying, you know, this is a, a 
huge humanitarian struggle that we've been facing uh, for several decades. And it's something that as a country, as a city, as a state, we really created. And I'm what I want to do today is just kind of walk through a little bit of the background, walk through kind of where homelessness is at today, what kind of our upcoming threats are, and um, what the path forward is, um, if that sounds good. Um, next slide. Um, so the... Um, <laughs> Sorry, he's on the phone. Um, we'll catch up later. Really, the way I like to talk about homelessness is as a tale of two acts. And we've had two uh, episodes of mass homelessness in the United States. Um, the last one, of course, was during the Great Recession. And um, next slide. And each of those kind of tell a different story of how we responded as a country. And so the... Um, um, the first one, um, during the great recession, we had, you know, over, over a million men, women, and children that experienced homelessness in the United States. And we responded by investing in housing. Of course, there was the jobs act. There was a number of different things that we did to pull ourselves out of it. It kind of accumulated in the housing act of 1937, um, which really gave people in the United States a right to housing, um, not just housing, but safe and sanitary housing. Next slide. And, um, we were able to, you know, move our way out of the situation. Um, um, and then things changed, um, in starting in the late 1970s, but in the, um, early 1980s, um, especially the first three years of the Reagan era, um, the federal housing, um, funding was cut by 78% and we completely walked our way out of housing. And in fact, this sort of accumulated in the housing act in 1998, that, rescinded that previous housing act and said that we cannot provide housing for everyone in the United States or even a majority of its citizens. Next slide. Um, so these are some of the things that we did since then. Um, we really starved public housing. Um, and so we lost, you know, over a quarter of a million units. Um, we kind of stepped away from repairs. Um, then we kind of said, okay, now we need private investment to save it. Um, we had all these units mortgaged off. Um, next slide. Um, and we really had our, our most permanent form of low income housing that served the very poorest people um, disappear. Um, so it really, um, uh, we really had a situation. And when we were tearing down all this housing, we weren't doing one to one replacement. We were only replacing it with a smaller number of units and then um, the rebuilds. And then a lot of those were. Um, um, higher income. Here in San Francisco, this is a major reason for um, the huge decrease in our African American community um, from 14% um, to down to today is about 5%. A lot of that, there's also gentrification, rising housing costs, et cetera, all of those as well. But um, the loss of public housing was a huge piece. Next slide. So what we have today is this huge amount of homelessness in San Francisco, and it really has this ripple effect. And I like to kind of, you know, talk about this because um, sometimes people don't feel connected to homelessness as an issue, um, but it really affects all of us. And um, if you look at just one area of homelessness, it's health. And when people are homeless, their health deteriorates rapidly. And in fact, they're about 25 years elder, their calendar year. So as a 50 year old woman, I would appear medically as a 75 year old woman if I had been homeless for a period of time. So what that means is, is that a small amount of, uh, we basically are costing about $40,000 in ER costs alone um, per homeless person. Um, we also, you know, my kids were in public schools. We always had homeless kids in each of the classrooms. Um, they were in crises, experienced a lot of trauma. That had an impact as well. Um, we have, you know, just... Um, of course, the loss of human life. Um, we've got this tremendous police response to homelessness that wastes police resources responding to something instead of, you know, and so then the, the overtime costs soar. 
Um, we've got the psychiatric crises every month because as people are homeless for longer and longer, their mental health deteriorates. Um, so, and so all these impacts next slide. Um, so, um, in San Francisco, I just want to break down the numbers real quick. Um, next slide, please. Um, we have, um, so we just did our count this year. We don't got the numbers back from them. Hopefully it's down, but we've got about 70, 7,754 homeless people in the point in time count. Um, they estimate about uh, 20,000 homeless people over the course of the year. Um, and it's important to just kind of know who, who are we talking about here? So um, most of the 23% of folks were homeless for the first time. 35% um, lived in San Francisco for more than 10 years. Three quarters came homeless as how San Franciscans, 70%. Um, 60% um, have a report having one or more health conditions. Uh, and then I want to talk about mental health and substance use disorder. It's kind of an interesting thing here. Upon entry into homelessness, it's a really small percentage in terms of what causes homelessness, uh, mental health and, and substance use, um, really um, only 12% or only 7% upon entry into homelessness for mental health. Um, but as people are homeless for longer and longer, the proportion of people with mental health issues is much higher. And so the trauma of being homeless is causing folks mental health to deteriorate and it, and people start self-medicating with drugs and alcohol, develop addictions, and then the rate of addiction gets really higher. So from comparing before and after the pandemic, we had a huge increase in substance use um, disorders among our unhoused population. So, oops, we lost the slideshow. Um, uh, next slide, please. Um, so I want to just briefly talk about kids. We don't think about families with kids, but this is a huge, um, a huge issue for us in San Francisco. Um, we've got um, 40 percent of our kids that are living in um, below the poverty line in San Francisco are unhoused. Um, our, um, we have about 3000 homeless children in San Francisco. Um, we don't have a classroom, um, that doesn't have at least one homeless child in San Francisco public schools. Um, and it's a really ignored population and a population we really focus on at the coalition on homelessness. Um, the majority of, um, our homeless population are African-American, um, in terms of, or people of color, African-Americans are 35%. We had a huge increase during the pandemic of Latinos experienced homelessness, 55% increase. Um, and um, so, you know, we saw as people, Latinos being in the service sector, losing their jobs, losing their housing, um, that was a big impact. Um, and um, about a third of the population identifies as LGBTQ. So I really think it's important for us when we think about homelessness, we need to think about it as an intersection of all these different oppressions and injustices that we're facing in San Francisco. It really is kind of the face of racism, of homophobia, of classism. I mean, this is who is experiencing homelessness and it's very interconnected to um, uh, to these other racial injustices and, and, and um, other disparities. Uh, next slide. So I wanna talk now about solutions. Um, shoot, I didn't bring my clock up with me. Um, hopefully I'm not going over time. Um, so system flow is something that we now talk about in San Francisco, um, or in, in across the country is a big practice, um, based on data. And it's really, um, about trying to end homelessness means you're not, you're not going to have a situation where some, nobody's ever going to experience homelessness again. We're really talking about ending mass homelessness. And when people are homeless, they're homeless for a very short period of time, and it's rare and it's brief, right? That's really what, what, what we're trying to get to. And system flow is this idea that um, you want to move people, you want to prevent people from being homeless in the first place. And then if we, if it is unpreventable, let's say a situation of domestic violence or a fire or something that then they're very quickly back into housing and, um, and that's called system flow. And it's about investments in each of those buckets. Next slide. So there's been a lot of talk in San Francisco about, um, why not just, you know, why not just build a lot of shelters, and let's just open up a ton of shelters and at least we can get people off the streets. And so um, that's kind of a, a notion that um, uh, is just not supported by the science. 
And so it's just not um, helpful um, because what happens is, is that if you, if you have an amount of money to spend and you spend it all on shelter, people get stuck in shelter, those shelter beds fill up and they're still homeless and they never move into housing. That's basically what happens in New York City. You know, you have a whole generations of people who are living in shelter for decades on end um, with no escape in sight. And it's really, um, their health outcomes are not great. It's still really traumatizing. It's just not a humane situation for them. So I, um, oops, they did, it, this slide did a weird thing, but this is kind of comparing, um, the um the cost to from housing to shelter and you know the safe sleeping villages is just to put it up a tent in san francisco we spent about seventy thousand per tent took about three months to come up um our typical shelters like our navigation centers cost about 20 to 50k to start up um per person per unit you know per person that they're going to serve about 40k per person per year um uh they took about nine to 14 months to come up um, acquisitions, on the other hand, we were buying hotels and at 400K per unit, and then we're spending 20K per um, unit to operate. And if you put that out over time, you end up saving a lot more money with um, housing, or you can do a housing subsidy um, in the private market for about 40K with support services um, per household on average and, um, and see um, people get into housing immediately. So I'd like to bring this up because I'm trying to move people out of this idea that it's faster and cheaper to do shelter. Um, what we wanna do is a combination of things. Next slide. Um, so this is kind of where the city that where the city money is at right now. Um, so we've got, um, right now, most of the city funding is going to housing, which is a good thing. Um, and then temporary shelter and then prevention is at 8%. Where we're really kind of falling down as a city is that prevention piece. We, we are having a lot of people entering homelessness. And so, you know, um, in the last homeless count they had for about every five people, I mean, for every one person they housed about five new people became homeless. I mean, it's just, it's just, a, we, we, we got to have those, um, uh, uh, interventions in place so that people stay in their home. So that's sometimes a short-term subsidy or a medium-term subsidy or a long-term subsidy. I'll give a couple examples. So, Let's say it's a family or a household or a person who does um, kind of labor jobs. They get injured and they're out of work. Um, maybe they're undocumented and don't have protections. Um, um, or maybe the, um, you know, the um, disability insurance isn't going to cover, it doesn't cover your full uh, wages. And so you don't have enough to pay rent. Um, so that person would need a short-term subsidy to stay inside their housing. And then once their injury is healed, they're back to work and everything's good. Um, let's say we have an elder who's in a rent control unit whose um, rent is slowly sliding up above their fixed income on Social Security. That person, you want to have a little subsidy. You can have a, they call them shallow subsidies, a smaller subsidy to keep them in their home for the rest of their lives. And that's obviously going to be a lot better than them becoming homeless. And then remember those costs of housing people being so high, right? So, and the human toll and all of that. So, um, so that's really the idea here. Um, I have this little box on the bottom. I'm going to be talking about, um, prop C in a little bit, um, but because of the new investments in housing, we've really been able to house a lot more people in San Francisco. Went from 15 to before a week before Prop C to about 56 per week now. Next slide. So um, in 2018, um, we, this is a really kind of a, I mean, it's just such a beautiful story. And um, uh, I think we talked about it here at the time, um, but um, we basically um, gathered um, signatures and wrote an initiative to put on the ballot to tax corporate income starting at 50 million, five zero, 50 million, about an average of a half a percent. Um, and it ha the money has to go to housing, treatment, prevention, and shelter. And um, we basically... Um, we got it passed and then we got sued and it was in the courts for a couple of years. And then we won the lawsuit and then the money got released. And so um, basically um, this is a breakdown of how the money is spent. And it's, it was about 300 a year because of the pandemic and stuff changing. It's now about 250 million a year. Um, but um, next slide. Um, 
So this is what, um, by the end of this fiscal year, um, if things go the way we are anticipating, um, these are the numbers of what we've been able to do with Prop C. Um, and so 400 and, um, 4,453 permanent housing slots, a 45% increase, um, 400 more treatment beds, and then a whole bunch of kind of intensive case management services for folks who are out on the streets. Um, a 26% increase in shelter, and then about 4,000 um, households being prevented from being um, displaced. Um, so I wanted to talk to you about this because this is really like each of these numbers represents a story of liberation for somebody. Somebody who was suffering and homeless. This was done because people got together and did something they'd never done before and just got it together and did it. And um and so we still have a long way to go. We didn't expect to solve homelessness, but we are the only municipality in the entire West Coast. Um, I think there's one small city, but that saw a decrease in homelessness after the pandemic. And that was, I mean, so many people were losing their housing during the pandemic, even though we had an eviction moratorium, because most of the folks that become homeless are in informal housing. They're not in housing where you have a lease, you're renting, you know, you're paying to a to a roommate or to a family. You know, I mean, you you know, and when you don't pay, you leave, and 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 this is how it works. Um, so this was really amazing, and we're hoping with this next count, we'll see another decrease um, because of these numbers. Um, but if we don't do a good job on prevention, then we'll, you know, in keeping people in their homes, then we're always going to be kind of like swimming upstream. And so what we wanted to do with this measure is we really wanted to make sure that kids and youth got housing so that in the future, um, so 25% of the housing has to go to um, families and 20% um, has to go to youth um, because right now the system is set up that you have to be homeless for, you know, decades before you get help. And so we're really trying to turn that around and really look at a long view and say, look, if we have some serious investments, we can really overcome this in the long run. Next slide. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about human rights. One of the things that we're up against is um, the anti-homeless laws. We have a lawsuit right now against the city. Um, basically, um, people get um, cited and arrested um, in our lawsuit, they, you know, 3,000 times. Um, the way the law reads right now is, is that you, um, the municipalities have to offer shelter. Um, they can't just arrest somebody um, or cite them if they don't have any other choice. And so, um, next slide. And I think you got somebody who's waiting to be admitted in there. Um, so when um, you can see here in this graph, the down line is the investment in housing. So as the federal governments cut that funding for housing, the response from the municipalities was to do criminalization. And so all these new anti-homeless laws started passing. And so that's been the response. That sucks up a huge amount of resources. And it's not effective because no ticket, no arrest is going to lead someone out of homelessness. Um, it just perpetuates and actually exacerbates homelessness because it makes it harder for them to get off the streets. Next slide. So um, let's see. Um, I am. Oh, it's okay. Um, so I wanted to just do, uh, upcoming threats really quickly. I have information on the back table about this, but we're really concerned about prop F, which would cut people off of welfare who are suspected drug users. Um, the idea is that they would be mandated into treatment. Um, the problem is, is that you just miss an appointment and you, you know, we we're expecting a huge increase in homelessness over this initiative. And it's also going to waste, um, clinical, um, time because we have a clinician shortage. It's going to pull clinicians, um, to do these assessments. Um, and, um, forced treatment, all the data shows it's really not effective. It drives up overdoses, drives up suicides, and it kicks people out who are trying to get treatment. We have tons of people on the streets right now. Half of them are getting turned away when they're trying to get treatment. And we don't want to have people being put into treatment that, um, are not ready for treatment at the expense of people who are wanting to get treatment and who are ready and need the support to survive and thrive. So, um, that's, um, that's one of the issues. I have a volunteer sign-up sheet back there if people want to get involved to do tabling. I have a, um, information sheets, um, and you can talk to your friends about this, and there's a website with more info. Supreme Court is going to be hearing this in June. They may overturn that little right that I just talked about, um, and municipalities would then be able to arrest and cite whether people are um, 
whether people are voluntary or involuntarily homeless. Next slide. So, um, uh, so basically, um, these are some of the things that we're working on. Sorry, when on in the PDF translation, this slide got a little messed up, but we're working on a whole bunch of budget campaigns to try to move to get some more housing subsidies. Um, we're working on Prop C to make sure every dime is used efficiently. Um, the access system is really messed up for housing right now. We're trying to transform that. It's called coordinated entry. Um, we're trying to really uh, make sure that people's behavioral health needs are uh, met. Um, and we really push on this idea of housing po post-treatment. One of the things that we found in a, in a study that we did is, is that a lot of folks are benefiting from treatment, but after treatment end up back on the streets. And um, we really want to make sure folks are stabilized and stop that revolving door um, that we're seeing. Um, and then we've been pushing to have behavioral health services in the um, shelters and drop-ins. Um, the diverse and dignified shelter, um, we are keep pushing for lots of different kinds of shelter, not just big warehouses. Um, and then human rights for people on the streets, making sure they have shower access, water, sanitation access, um, and that the city follows their own policies, that they don't destroy people's property, um, which is what they've been doing, but bag and tag it so people can get it back, and that they cr um, stop criminalizing people who have no other choice but to be on the streets. These are all policies the city already has that they're not following, and a big part of our um, lever on that one is our lawsuit. So um, I'm going to stop there. I apologize if I went over time. Um, I really should have had my watch up here. Okay. Okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> All right, so does anyone have any questions or comments that you wanna make? Um, yeah, go ahead, sir. Okay, but one is I keep reading that there are four vacant units that are people. We do have a microphone, so. Yeah, so he just said, I keep hearing that there's more vacant units than there are homeless people. Yeah, so why can't we get people into those vacant units? And the second related to that is the tax, the tax that was passed on landlords for keeping units vacant. Is that happening? Is that helping? Yeah. Okay. Great question. So when people talk about those vacant units, um, there's a couple of things that are happening there. There is vacancies in our current supportive housing um, um, portfolio in San Francisco because of that coordinated entry, they basically changed the ac the way homeless people access housing and they did it in such a way that it's really broken. So um, we end up with long, um, long uh, bouts of vacancies in supportive housing, which it just like makes you want to pull your hair out because all these people are trying to get housing and then the units are sitting empty because of the bureaucratic bungling that's happening. So we're working on fixing that. But most of the vacant units are in the private market, and it's mostly units that um, are purchased um, for uh, um, people want to kind of like dump their wealth into real estate, and then they keep them empty. And, you know, some of them are um, uh, foreign investments and stuff like that. And so the idea was for the vacancy tax was to try to address that. Um, I, you know, they also write off the loss of rental income as a loss on the taxes. So I don't, uh, you know, um, I don't know that it's going to have a magical effect on it. Um, but it at least creates some more, generates some more revenue. Um, and it's a very difficult, uh, thing to address that the private market vacancies. Yeah. So not the most helpful answer in the world, but <clears throat> Jennifer, we have some written questions oh, here. Oh, yay. Fun. What impact did APEC have on the homeless? Home, yeah, home on the homeless. Yeah. So we did a bunch of outreach during APEC talking to folks about um what was happening. I mean, they kind of walled off a section of the city. And so obviously the people who were in there during that time. Um, we're going to, you know, we're going to move out of there anyway, because it was going to be really difficult to get around. Um, we did, you know, there was some kind of forced displacement type stuff without, um, they didn't really, um, make space for people. Um, they ended up trying to set aside shelters in shelter beds in a shelter that's very popular, um, run by Dolores street. So that ended up displacing some folks there, um, but overall, I think, you know, 
we have so many festivals and stuff in San Francisco. And so, I mean, unhoused people are used to basically having to move when those things occur, you know, Carnival or Pride or, you know, I mean, all these different big parades we have and stuff like that. So um, we didn't, get, we actually didn't get a huge amount of complaints from unhoused people um, about the, about um, uh, the festival, but there was a, a, um, uh, a lot of kind of forced moving, um, and threats going on. We'll take your property or we'll cite you if you don't move kind of thing. Um, so, um, but I kind of feel like people would have kind of scooted out of the area anyway, because, you know, um, of the, the situation that was going on and all this, how hard it is to get in and out of that area. So, um, yeah. And then I think there was another one, huh? We have written questions, but we also have a question here in the back. Thank you. I understand that Buena Vista and Horace Mann provide homeless um, overnight stays in the school. Is that sufficient for homeless families? And is it working well? Can you speak on that? Yeah. So... Um, yeah, so uh, Buena Vista Horseman, um, yeah, so it's uh, basically only for kids who have um, uh, parents who have kids in Unified. It's kind of a beautiful thing because San Francisco Unified has taken responsibility for like trying to make use utilizing their facilities and recognizing that they have so many kids that are experiencing homelessness. Um, it is the only shelter right now that is just like you're able to call and stay at. Is it sufficient? I mean, it's a mat on the floor um, and um, it's uh, um, it's nighttime only. Um, they are open on the weekends um, around the clock. And, um, you know, so, um, so it definitely has its deficiencies. That said, there's a lot of turnaways and they're trying to expand um, and get um, back to the level they were pre-pandemic, which the city is telling them no. And they're also um, short on blankets. They have cots that are broken there that the city's not giving them money to replace. Um, the mats are in really bad shape. Um, yeah, so I think it is really not being adequately um, funded by the city. And so um, that creates even more more issues, yeah. Oh, I mean, it's, you know, um, we pushed for a long time to have our emergency shelter, the other emergency shelter we had, which was at um, um, First Friendship Baptist Church. Um, we really wanted that moved and we ended up getting it moved to Oasis, which is which, right down the street from here. And um, that was a big campaign we did a couple years ago and used Prop C money to buy the building. And so instead of the family sleeping on mats, um, nighttime only, having to leave, bring their belongings and go during the day, um, they now have hotel rooms with bathrooms and um, showers, and it's a lot more dignified and um uh, that's a really beautiful thing. So we definitely want to see, you know, a higher level. Um, but for now, you know, we're trying to just get one of East Horseman at least to a better level than it's at now. Yeah. Uh, does the city have any, um, okay, thanks. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Does the city have any, uh, responsibility for providing toilets for people? I mean, are there any places where everybody has access to a toilet and, and water? Is it, who's that, who's supposed to be responsible for that? Taking care of yourself when you're out. Yeah. Any, anybody, are you just responsible for yourself? Is well, I mean, legally the city doesn't, there's no like a uh, mandate that the city provide it, but it, I would say it is the city's responsibility um, and part of their department of public works. And so we've, we've pushed for them to do that. Um, they have these um, pit stops that are basically um, portable bathrooms and they are um, listed online in terms of the sites and locations and hours. Um, they're insufficient and they often change the schedule and close, close them down and, you know, that kind of thing. Um, you know, we, um, we've done a lot of work around water access. And one of the things we've been pushing is for having water stations, which, which benefit everybody, you know, because you could, you know, refill your, 
your bottle and it's, you know, it's healthy and encouraging people to drink Hetch Hetchy and, you know, all that kind of stuff, less um, uh, plastic bottle usage, you know, there's just so many benefits um, beyond, you know, um, destitute people who, who need access to water. So we've gotten about six of those water stations put in. Um, we need to, we always need to have a sponsor. So like an organization or a person that kind of takes responsibility for them. Um, some of them are under threat because they're like, oh, they're being used too much and they don't like like unhoused people like coming and using the water. So it's, it's kind of, it's, 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 a, it's the same with the bathrooms. You know, we get a bathroom in place and then people complain that people are using the bathroom. So it, it's really, um, it's really a constant struggle. Um, but we're not at the point, you know, really the solution to that is to have more bathrooms, right. And to have more water stations, and then you have less congregation around any particular site. And so, um, that's, we're not there yet, but we definitely need to need to have more of that. Absolutely. Jennifer, we have more written questions here. Can you uh, talk about the loss of housing, public housing in the 1970s? What was hope six, which was on one of your slides? Yeah. So we also had, yeah. So hope six was a, actually a Clinton era, um, where they, um, targeted public housing and more higher kind of real estate areas, tore it down and rebuild it. And, um, you know, I mean, one of the things is this whole idea around, um, kind of ghettoization and, uh, you know, having public housing, no access to banks, schools, et cetera. Um, but the funny thing is, is that Hope Six targeted the areas that you did have access to all of that. And they were in like the more higher real estate areas. And they they tore down the housing and then rebuilt them um, with fewer units. And then of those units, only some of them were extremely low income and they did mixed income. And so um, that's that was responsible for a loss of the, the over quarter million units there. Um, so thinking about San Francisco, um, the public housing in North Beach, um, the public housing in, um, the housing at, uh, um, um, Bernal dwellings, um, on, on Cesar Chavez, um, the public housing in, um, on Har Harrison and, um, and Cesar Chavez, um, they used to call them army street projects back in the day. Um, and then the, um, some of the housing in, um, what well, we used to call it OC, but, um, in the Western edition, um, on in lower hate um, area. And so those were all hope six projects where they previously were towers, they tear down the towers and then rebuild. Um, so, you know, there was a way to do it right. And San Francisco, we ha we did have a huge resistance and called for one-to-one -one replacement. And so um, we weren't 100% successful in that organizing, but we did a lot better than a lot of other municipalities. In other areas, it just completely wiped out their public housing stock. But because San Francisco, there was more of a struggle involved, it wasn't quite as bad as it was in other areas. And, and eventually we were able to get them um, to do a much more one-to-one -one replacement. Um, and then San Francisco did the, um, did Hope SF, um, on the big housing, um, developments at, um, Potrero Hill, Alice Griffith, um, Bayview Hunters Point and Sunnydale. And those are all being rebuilt, but those are being done in a way that it is one-to-one -one replacement. Um, but it has slowed down and which is beautiful because those, ho those housing were in really bad shape and the electrical upgrades and everything. So that's a good thing. However, the downside of it is, is that we really haven't been able to use that housing stock in a long time because they've had to set aside vacancies for the units that are being torn down to move other people into. So it's really slowed down public housing as a, um, as a solution to homelessness in San Francisco. Once that's done though, we're going to be able to have, um, hopefully a lot more people being able to move in. So, um, uh, hopefully that answered your question. Yeah. Can you say what percentage of homeless in San Francisco came from outside the state? Is this a magnet city for homeless? And if so, is there a solution? Yeah. So um, uh, great questions, everyone. Okay. So 70% of unhoused people in San Francisco became homeless as um, a resident of San Francisco. So that leaves 30%. Very few of those came from out of state. Um, I can't remember the exact percentage, but most of them are, I think, 20 of that 30 or more are surrounding 
um, Bay Area and most of the rest are inside California. Um, every municipality in the country, whether it's um, uh, Las Vegas, who, you know, believe for a long time that uh, people, homeless people came there for the winter because of the weather, um, you know, and then, you know, I mean, basically every municipality thinks of themselves as a magnet. And so, um, so that, um, but when you look at the data, everyone has kind of the same percentage of people coming from outside as homeless people. And so it's a pretty complicated question. I, you know, it's really, it really looks like any other kind of migration patterns, like people come for jobs, for family. Um, those are the two main reasons. Um, but there's usually, you know, like, and then things fall apart or, you know, something happens, the job falls through or whatever. Um, uh, but there is, um, uh, there is a, a small portion of the unhoused community that do move around. Um, but it seems to be the same in every, in pretty much every city. So we don't really have to worry about um, the magnet thing as much as the politicians would like us to. Um, I just want to say that that's been kind of really hammered into all of our heads and kind of like permeated our psyche because it's a very convenient um, political trope um, because it lets the policymaker off the hook. We can't do more for homeless people because they'll just more will come in. And it's also a way to other the population. So like in San Francisco, San Franciscans feel less empathy for the unhoused population if they think they came from outside. So they do all this polling on it and stuff. And that's why they use it as a political trope. So um, that's why we all kind of like, it's kind of permeated our psyche because they've been telling us this for decades. Yeah. Is the influx of refugees impacting the homeless situation? How is San Francisco doing to take care of arriving immigrants? Yeah, it has not been as large as we thought it was going to be. Um, but there is an increased, there definitely is uh, mostly households with kids um, uh, that we're seeing in our, um, in our shelter system, seeking shelter. I don't know the exact numbers. Um, but, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, it's maybe one every few days kind of a situation. Um, yeah. Who or what has replaced Lava May providing shower trucks for homeless people? Yeah. Ooh, yeah. Very, very sad. So there's, the Department of Public Works does do some shower trucks. Um, we don't really have a replacement, I would say, um, for the most part, though. Um, uh, there is, you know, um, there's um, the places where people can still get showers. Um, they can get them at Cap Street um, in the Mission 165 cap, and they can get them at, um, YM, um, in the Tenderloin and then Mother Brown's in the Bayview. Um, there's not a ton of shower options, um, for folks. Um, so we're definitely feeling that loss. Seems the population was happy seeing investment in homelessness. If someone else businesses pays for it. <laughs> Is this because people feel that subsidizing someone else is basically unfair to people who struggle to keep their own housing? Well, I don't know, but I would say that the reason that we structured the proposal, um, the Prop C, the way we did is, is that we really wanted it to be a classic kind of tax the rich house the poor. And locally, we can't do income tax, so we're left with the corporate tax. So that's why we decided to do the rich corporation thing. And it is true that if people aren't paying for it themselves, I think, you know, part of that has to do with maybe their bottom line. Some of that has to do with, you know, we have a very anti-tax culture. People don't like paying taxes. Um, so um, so there's a lot to it. But that that is the way we structured Prop C that way because, um, and I think... Um, you know, for us, there was previously a sales tax measure on the ballot. Um, and that was also that failed and that was supposed to go to homeless people, um, that, um, was put on by, uh, Mark Farrell, I believe in London breed. We didn't, we didn't really love that because, um, 
it's a regressive tax. And it means that actually the poorest people pay a larger portion of their income. And so we really like progressive taxes because um, it's just more fair. And so people who can afford to pay should pay more. And so we don't really love the whole sales tax thing um, because of that. So, um, you know, but there's very limited options for taxation for local, for, um, for like a city of San Francisco. Yeah. I noticed that you had a footnote on one of your slides saying become a homeless ally. Yeah. And I'm wondering if there's any organized way where people who might make an individual connection and do something could do that. Yeah. So one way to do it is to go on our website, cohsf.org and sign up for our newsletter. And so that, I mean, our uh, action alert. And so when we have hearings and stuff like that, you can come to, um, Another way for people to, um, we have a couple working groups. Um, we have a human rights working group that meets every Wednesday at 1230, a housing justice on Tuesdays at 12. Um, that's a way for um, allies to get involved. And basically we do campaigns and, and it's kind of this um, way for people to get involved and people can do outreach and stuff like that and learn about other things. Um, on particular campaigns, like for no on F, you know, we'll have speakers bureau trainings and, and the like. And so, um, if there's any particular thing you're interested in, you, all of our emails are on the website and you can email me and we can, and we can talk more. Yeah. Here's something written on the note cards. What about voluntary homeless media focuses? Why not go inside? Yeah. I think that's been another kind of political trope in a lot of ways. Um, for most people, um, what they're talking about, you know, they'll, for example, so um, the mayor's been focusing on this a lot. So it, it, one of the outreaches I was on, or I was monitoring a sweep, um, there was a man in a wheelchair that was being offered um, a bed in a top bunk that he couldn't climb into. So he wanted shelter but he couldn't. So he's considered involuntary homeless because he was offered something and said no. And so um, another man I talked to had been um, raped in shelter before, did could not do a congregate shelter, but that was more than willing to go into a private room, but because he just couldn't, can't sleep in congregate shelter. He just, it brings up too much, too, it triggers his PTSD. So um, so there's all those kind of situations. There's a whole bunch of reasons why people aren't gonna go into shelter, but, but we'd be more than willing to go into housing. Um, there is a situation where people have been homeless for a really long time that um, they don't really trust that any real housing is going to come forward. Um, they maybe were in housing and had a bad experience and stuff like that. And it, it, you know, we do as a system need to work with them more closely. It's a pretty rare situation. Um, uh, historically it's coming a little bit more common. And when I say a little bit, like a couple more people, you know, um, but for the most part, if you have the appropriate match for somebody, um, then they go inside and, uh, that's really, um, that's really the more typical thing. And sometimes, you know, people kind of use that as sort of a defense, like, oh, I want to be out of here because, you know, but then when you start digging down and, oh, do you have choices? Do you have somewhere else you could be? Actually, the reality is they don't have any other choices and it's really not a voluntary situation. So I'd, I'd be pretty dubious whenever I hear policymakers talk about that. One other thing, Mayor Breed keeps putting out press releases about the sweeps and saying X percentage of people um, refuse shelter. Those numbers come from whenever they do a sweep operation, if they're if they have three shelter beds and there's 10 people, the refusal of shelter is the difference between how many people, um, how many people, how many people they had shelter for and how many people were in the encampment. So they'll always say then in that situation, seven people refuse shelter. So the numbers are very um falsified in that way. It's very frustrating. Um, yeah. So yeah. Um, okay. So I, I have a few questions. What about, what is your, um, your observation of small homes and how that has worked and whether that 
might be um, helpful for, for many, many people. I mean, there are so many levels of this. There's short-term, you know, planning and then long-term and, um, and it looks looks to me very much as if it's a city problem. Period. I mean, it, it doesn't. You know, HUD is not going to not going to help at all, and the federal government appears to not you know just be totally deadlocked. And um, so, small homes, city problem. What happens when the Supreme Court comes in and says that we can sweep? And then I'm really interested in you and how you got into this. I really am. I, this is amazing to listen to you and all the different levels of this and how you're working on all these different levels. So thank you. Okay, great. Let me, okay. So the first one, Small well, let me homes. do is the tiny homes. Yeah. Tiny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, so diversity of options is great. I mean, you know, tiny homes take up a lot of land. So, you know, um, one of the if we kind of like take over a hostel that's empty, a youth hostel that's empty, um, it's going to be cheaper and faster and we'll get more people in there because it's like multiple levels. Um, but you don't, we don't have all those buildings available to us. You know, we just, we just need a diversity of things. So the tiny home thing works great. Um, we like them better when there's a, um, when it's, you're really developing community and you have a residence council and they're deciding the rules and they're kind of taking responsibility for the space and you have a, um, uh, you know, and, and we find that in those models, it works really well around the country. Um, and it's great because it's a closed door, you have privacy, uh, you know, um, we see it as a temporary solution, not as a permanent solution because, um, um, it's shared bathrooms and um, no cooking facilities. And so we really, um, but you know, if you stay there for a longer period of time um, and people getting stabilized and even staying in, in a tiny home for a couple of years, but um, we don't see it. We see permanent housing really should have kitchens and bathrooms and showers. Right. Um, but we see it as a great option as an interim option um, for folks um, in terms of the second piece was um, the uh, federal uh, the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court, if um, this is what I get for not having my notebook up here, um, Supreme Court, if we um, if that gets overturned, um, we're just going to keep fighting on what we're fighting and try and try to get the city to have good policy and then try to get them to follow it. I mean, I think there's a lot of other um uh, constitutional angles we have, our lawsuit's going to still be alive. And there's a lot of other elements of the lawsuit that are important here. Um, there's the common sense, um, you know, the good government arguments, you know, we'll keep fighting for it. I think it's going to be a shame because, you know, it's like the one right that we've been able to kind of really use it as a, um, a good tool to force the city to provide more shelter and be more thoughtful about their street approach. Um, so, um, but I don't think it's going to be for unhoused people. If it gets overturned, it's not going to be, I'm hoping it's not such a dramatic change. Um, because at least in San Francisco, it may be in some other municipalities, but because we've, um, we've basically, um, I think done a pretty good job of beating back a lot of this stuff. And, um, and at the same time, the city hasn't really been following and, 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 um, embracing that. Right. So, um, I don't, you know, it's hard to say, could it, you know, I'm always kind of hopeful. So I'm hoping it won't get any worse. Um, if the Supreme court overturns it. Yeah. 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 So kind of, um, kind of random. So I, um, when I was out of college, um, I applied for a job at the second harvest food bank in San Mateo County. And it was a joint job, like a secretary job. I actually applied, um, as a truck driver for the food bank. And then they offered me a job as a secretary. That was a split job with the hunger and homeless action coalition. And I was always kind of social justice minded, but I just really, I fell in love with it and, um, worked for some amazing women, um, that really inspired me. And then, um, I, um, we, we used to, there was coalitions in each of the County, similar to ours funded by the Northern California grant makers. And they cut off the funding and we had a meeting with the funders and all the coalitions came, and everybody was being all polite and um 
but I, I mean, I wasn't impolite, but I basically very frankly said, you're making a mistake here. These co these, these groups are making a lot of progress and by cutting off the funding, you know, it's really gonna, gonna stop the, the progress. And so I was with the, um, the head of this San Francisco coalition on homelessness, Paul Bowden was there. He really loved the fact that I <laughs> spoke up to the funders. And then he then offered me a job later, um, to do fundraising for the organization here in San Francisco. And I've been here ever since. So I kind of fell in, you know, just fell into it, fell in love. And I just, I always feel like there's more work to do. And that keeps me going because, um, you know, and um, we'll keep doing it as long as I'm, I'm, I'm helpful. Yeah. For people picked up off the streets with serious alcohol and drug problems who are brought to San Francisco General Hospital, they are they can only be held for 72 hours per the 5150 law. They go out and the cycle is repeated. So what can you recommend? Should the law be changed to hold them? Yeah. So we're not a big fan of, um, of holding people in locked facilities because, um, I mean, I need to back up a second. We're super reliant on 5150s in our system, way too reliant. So people, most people, their very first interaction with the mental health system is in handcuffs, being brought to the hospital, being locked down on a table. Um, and that is the experience and it's incredibly traumatizing. And so what it does is, is it pushes people away from the mental health system and, um, creates this huge amount of trauma and fear for folks that, um, that have mental health issues. And so it's very counterproductive and often people are worse off from the mental health perspective after they go through that experience. So we have to remember that in and of itself is really traumatizing, but most of, like we do it thousands of times a year. There's a couple of things I would say. First of all, again, going back to that prevention piece, we have to have a system that is providing people the care when they need it, that's easy to access, that's in a drop-in basis, that's high quality. We have to have people stable in housing. Um, that's a big contributor to the mental health stuff. And we have to take all those steps in place and then decrease our reliance on 5150s. And I wouldn't say expand the law. I mean, there's definitely things that they can, they can, um, you know, improve about how it's implemented and there's different interpretations of the law and all that kind of stuff. And I'm sure that there's cases where people are gravely disabled that they should be conserved when they're not. Um, so all of that I think is really, um, and they can hold them longer. They are letting them go because they don't meet the criteria. They're totally stabilized and they don't present a harm to self or others. And so that's why they're letting them go. They're holding them. And we have a lot of people who are conserved per permanently in San Francisco. Um, and, um, I think there's like 1200 people on permanent conservatorship, um, and, um, but what we need to do is make sure that after someone is brought into the hospital, that there's really good planning on what happens after they leave. And so now they're stable. So the professional at San Francisco general says this person is stable. So how do we keep that stability? Do we send them back to the streets? Absolutely not. Is that what we're doing? Yes. Almost everybody is sent back to the streets and then they decompensate again. They're no longer stable and then they get hospitalized again. So how do you, if you have a severe mental illness, hang on to your medication when you're homeless? How do you keep your appointments with your psychiatrist? How do you do any of that stuff when you're just living in this complete state of chaos? right? So we have to make sure that people are stabilized. And that means the diversity of housing options. We have lost thousands of our boarding care, um, probably about 4,000 boarding care beds since the 1970s. So it's a lot of families run them and they bought a Victorian using your social security check. The state failed to pay people the proper rates in those facilities. A lot of them went out of business and we're continuing to lose them to this day. We can transform that boarding care model to have something that is really great for folks with severe mental illnesses where where you're developing community, um, you've got food included, and um, we do a nice job with it. And um, that's one option. Um, 
having other forms of housing with more intensive services like co-ops. We have those, but we don't have enough where people are in shared housing or private room housing and permanent supportive housing with a more elevated level of support services. There are solutions. We know what works. We don't have to rely on taking away people's individual liberties and locking them up forever. That is not what we have to do. We have to give people the support that they need so that they can thrive. And if they can't and they continue to be a danger to self and others, of course, then they need further, um, you know, further hospitalization, but that's not, um, that's kind of almost the lazy way, you know, it's like just kind of, you know, instead of doing the work we need to do to make sure that people have those, those, those ways to survive and thrive. Yeah. What is the situation in San Francisco for people who live in their vehicles? Well, we are having increasing numbers of people in their vehicles. Absolutely. Um, and, um, it's pretty rough and a lot of people in RVs, that was one of the largest jumps in the last homeless count. Um, it's really huge. And so, um, you kind of have two populations, you have a lot of kind of retired people, you, you have some working people and you've got a lot of families with kids. And so, um, safe parking for people in their RVs is a great option. Um, they already have kind of a ready home that they can live in and, um, you know, uh, you can put in portable showers and bathrooms. Um, you could have kind of RV parks. Um, you can set them up so that they can use their private bathrooms inside. If you have the black water disposal and all that stuff inside their RVs. Um, so there's, there's a lot of, um, that's a really good option. Um, if it's done right and done in a dignified way. Um, and, um, we have one parking site. We're trying to get one more and, um, you know, we'll keep, keep trying to get those. And that, that's actually even like, speaking of tiny homes, that's kind of the, uh, that's, that's also sort of like a uh, modular housing type situation, right. Um, with the RVs and, um, we had all those trailers donated from the state. Yeah. And people loved them. Um, and you can do such cool little, you know, designs inside and stuff. So it's definitely an, a, a good option, but it's not easy for folks who are out on the streets. It's really rough because they're getting their towed. They're getting, they're having to move. Um, they don't have the access to the, um, to the sanitation and, and it's not a good situation at all. Does San Francisco have a ballot measure? Is it ballot uh, proposition one that we're voting? Uh, proposition one is a statewide ballot. Um, that one is, um, I would give it mixed reviews. Um, we haven't taken a position on it yet um, just because we've been so overwhelmed. Um, there's good stuff in it because it's got bond money for housing and for more treatment facilities. Um, the thing that's kind of problematic or that's really problematic is they take the Mental Health Services Act fund, kind of typical Newsom, you know, robbing Peter to play Paul. He takes away the Mental Health Services Act money and then moves it over to kind of state controlled. And the Mental Health Services Act was um, a 1% tax on millionaires. And it was really designed with a ton of input from mental health consumers. And it really um, tries to address the whole person needs and is very flexible in terms of municipalities kind of figuring out what the best way to, to address the mental health needs of people are. And so they have it more prescripted, take it away and then have it for housing. Um, of course, we want more housing. Um, it's really frustrating though, because, um, you know, what they should have done is had new revenue source instead of taking away from an existing revenue source and then moving it over like that. So that's a really frustrating piece of it. Um, a lot of the money will be used for locked facilities, I'm sure. Um, which I, you know, kind of mentioned, I'm not too loving on the over-reliance there. Um, so, yeah. So, you know, you guys can kind of figure out what, where you want to land there, but it's, um, it's, they could have done it a lot better and it's, it's not ideal. Yeah. We noticed that so many on the streets may just be mentally unstable and thus are homeless, but are a danger to themselves and others, but refuse help. So what can be done about them? Police are needed, right? Aren't police really necessary? Yeah. So, so right now, if people are a danger self to others, then they do meet the criteria for conservatorship. So, um, as I mentioned, then, um, you know, they, they 
can be brought into the hospital. And then if they're stabilized on medication, um, they're not going to hold them if they're stable and they're doing fine and they're able to care for themselves. Um, and then that's when they let them go. And that, that, that was kind of my point there. So um, we don't take issue with, you know, if someone is danger to self or others, obviously there needs to be some kind of intervention. Um, do police need to be the ones that are intervening? Not always. Um, you can have a paramedic do that job. You can have, um, uh, um, we've got the skirt team that has a paramedic along with a peer. Um, so there's, um, uh, one of the issues with police is that we've kind of had the police department, um, basically taking care of everything, like all these different socioeconomic issues that then, um, you know, you know, that's when you end up with slow response times with huge overtime bills with, you know, all this kind of stuff, because, you know, there's a lot of situations that police handle that they don't need to be responding to. They don't need to be responding to wellness calls. They don't need to respond to homeless calls. Um, psychiatric crises, you could have other professionals responding. It doesn't have to be police. Of course, if there's a weapon involved or something like that, then we're talking about a different situation. But there's just on the homeless calls alone, there's about 90,000 a year that the police respond to. So that have no weapons, no um, no uh, criminal activity, no nothing, just the very presence of homeless people. So, you you know, you, you a lot of these things we're using police for that we don't need to. Police are very expensive. They're a quarter million a pop. Um, they're highly trained in weapons. Um, you know, um, they're not trained in social services. Um, and so they're often an inappropriate response and it's not a good government response to have police handling everything because they're very, they, they're, they're supposed to be a specialty, you know, entity that's responding to particular situations. And so, um, yeah. This is kind of more of a comment and I think you've already addressed it, but I want to honor asking every question from yeah. Zoom. So they said, but more affordable housing is needed than shelters, homeless people, want their own affordable housing with their own bathrooms and kitchens and tiny homes and RV trailers and shelters should be temporarily. Sorry, that's exactly how it was written. Yeah, yeah, temporary, exactly. That's the, having tiny homes is a temporary stay, um, investing heavily in permanent housing. And what that means is, is that that is that system flow I talked about. So we're preventing people at the front end from becoming homeless. And then the stay in shelter should be as short as possible. And then that makes room for the next person to be able to come in. Because as you noticed on the chart, shelter is really expensive. So if we move people through the system um, and they get into housing, they're no longer homeless. And that's ideally the way, that's exactly ideally the way that the system should work. And um, we absolutely need affordable housing. Affordable, meaning affordable to the very, very poorest people, also affordable to everybody else. But when we're talking about homeless people, we're really talking about the bottom 20% of the income um, scale. Um, so people who are on social security, public benefits, and then very low wage workers. Yeah. Thank you for waiting. So um, one of the, the points that you made that I never that I never thought of before was board and care homes. And I'm wondering if um, if there's any cooperation, coordination with Daly City in terms of, you know, I mean, the, the I think I from what I understand, the board and care homes here are basically gone. But I think that I think of Daly City as a less expensive um a place nearby where there might be some kind of of work done agreements and plus the population is very very caring in Delhi city i mean yeah. i think that you no know, anyway i mean i'm sure you've you you've thought all of this stuff out but it just it just struck me that you know yeah. about the yeah, there's not a lot in terms of the system. There's not a lot of um, there's a there's more collaboration around the locked facilities than the volunteer facilities, and more collaboration around domestic violence. But um, on the voluntary facilities, most of the municipalities prioritize people from within their own county, um, and they're unable to meet the needs of their own county and aren't as interested in bringing people in from out of county. Um, unless you're like, but it, it is a possibility because we could purchase um, beds and stuff like that. And that, that could be a possibility. Yeah, for sure. What are your observations on urban alchemy? Um, 
So um, Urban Alchemy is a group that um, I don't know how familiar folks are, um, but they, they're they really kind of a jobs program for people who are leaving, um, who are post-incarceration. Um, and they've taken a lot of kind of quasi-security um, contracts. Um, and so we... Um, we have a lot of um, admiration for the jobs part of stuff, um, but we have a lot of critiques around them um, not having um, adequate training and not having a really strong um, um, ethical guidelines. Um, and so a lot of the urban alchemy kind of engage in policing where they're moving people away from public space um, and um, not supporting them. Um, in terms of getting them um, connected to services. And so, um, yeah, so that's that's basically our feelings on them. Yeah. This is great. I'm loving all this engagement. It's always so much fun coming here. So I think you addressed on this, but tell us about your background and how you got into homeless. Yeah, I kind of explained that. You know, I just sort of fell into it. Um um, I grew up in Redwood City, um, come from middle upper class family, Catholic schools. Um, and, um, you know, I'll just add to what I said before. I just I really see this issue as an intersection of um, a lot of places. And I see a lot of hatred against the population. And that really um, it keeps me working at it to try to um, to try to fight back. And there's just so much more work to do. Um, I'll also just add to it that. Um, home is a really important space for me. And so I relate to this issue on a personal level um, and, you know, having kids and seeing how they just let go once they're home and having that stability and what it means. And so thinking about a lot of our folks um, not having that um, and just how, you know, how troubling that is, 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 is another piece of what draws me to the work. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Jennifer. The speaking for the Human Rights Working Group, we really applaud your work and thank you for it and the dedication you have made to this issue. Yeah. Well, um, when we close, Bruce Newberger is going to come up for a minute and give a statement or say something. But I wanted to invite you all to come back next week because for Black History Month, we have a special guest for you. We'll have uh, Dr. James Taylor from USF coming to speak to us about the Thirteenth Amendment. And then the week after that, we'll have a talk on police militarization. So please come back for those good talks. Thank you, Bruce. Okay, uh, I just a couple of announcements. No, no major statement. <laughs> um, we have books in the back on the table to as you're going to the leaving to the to the right on Palestine, Israel, the situation. If you're interested, uh, I just want to point that out. Those are for sale. Uh, there's also a sign-up sheet there for those of you who may not be on the forum email list uh, or the Human Rights Working Group list. You can sign there. And then we received this message yesterday from Faith in Action. You probably are familiar with that. They concentrate a lot on, on immigrants, and their work sort of intersects with what Jennifer was just talking about uh, with the homeless, uh, particularly among immigrants housing for immigrants. So there, I'm just gonna read the first paragraph, which kind of explains it. Uh, they're, they're calling for a meeting on Thursday, March the 7th at St. Anthony's uh, Catholic Church, which is over on Cesar Chavez. Uh, I think it's Cesar Chavez in Folsom, something like that. Okay, so that they say is, as Faith and Action Leader, I am contacting you today on behalf of families, mostly from Central and South America, some with infants, most with a number of children who have recently arrived in our quote unquote sanctuary city, but ours is a sanctuary city that has made commitments. And those of us on the Faith in Action English speaking core team have watched firsthand as San Francisco fails over and over to meet those commitments. So this is a meeting to talk about the failure of San Francisco. This is what I'm getting from this uh, to, uh, to rise to the occasion of the of those who are coming seeking uh, help here, who've come across the border, as you all know, very often for extreme situations, running from violence, 
uh, and and other extreme situations that are what cause people to leave their homelands. And they're coming here to San Francisco and they're not being served according to Faith in Action, which deals with this particular issue very, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. So anyway, this will be up on the flame. Uh, we'll, we'll at least we'll try to get it in there, but it's going to be March 7th. They're asking to try to get, they're trying to get five to 600 people to come to this meeting, which uh, to put more pressure on the city. So that's why I'm raising it here. So for those of you, so you'll know that's what they're trying to do. Thank you. Thank you. If any of you are worried about Gaza and you want Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, any of these people to push for a ceasefire, here's a bunch of postcards. Grab a couple, take them home, and you can mail them to them, and it, it could help. We need to keep telling them that that's what we want is our take on it. So thank you. start off by saying, you know, this is a, a huge humanitarian struggle that we've been facing uh, for several decades. And it's something that as a country, as a city, as a state, we really created. 